get your shit, you're coming with me. And uh, he took us to a concert because he, got, he had concert tickets and he wasn't gonna miss the concert. And it was uh, Pantera opening for Megadeth in 91 on the vulgar display of power and countdown through. And that was actually the first concert I ever went to. Wow. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until years later when I realized what it was that I had seen at, at such a young age, you know? And then as we just got older, it just progressed, you know, from Slayer to DSI, you know, from, I was, I was a big Fear Factory fan back in the <laughs> Hey, hey, shut, no, TV interview. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of my podcast. We have a very special guest today. We have uh, Brian Werner. Hi, Brian. What's up, everybody? So, how are you doing this evening? Oh, uh, tired, man. It's been a, it's been a very long day. Right. So, Brian, how how's the situation there with the with the COVID and lockdown and everything? What's happening now? I think COVID's all bullshit anyways. It's all political. I, I had COVID. I had COVID like three months ago and I was fine right. the next day by, by taking an anti-parasite drug. I think everybody's severely overreacting. I mean, it's not to say that it's not a thing. I mean, obviously people are dying from it. I mean, we know that, but right. here, in the, here in the United States, just a week ago, the CDC themselves even admitted that only 6% of the cases were actually directly related to COVID, you know, so I don't know, man. I've had my questions about it since day one because I had a good friend of mine was drinking and driving on his motorcycle and he wiped out and, and he died. And mm. I seen on the death certificate, it said C-19. Wow. And I was like, dude, I'm pretty sure him drinking and driving on the motorcycle had a lot more to do with how he died than some fucking COVID. So, but it, it sucks, man. I'm ready for everything to open up, man. You know, we run, we, uh, we have a strip club in town. I'm, I'm a talent buyer for, I book live music for them. And, you know, I'm ready to get back to, you know, concerts and, and everything else. Like everybody, man, that's being stuck in the house. Shit sucks. Yeah. And uh, actually nobody's talking about, you know, s staying home and, you know, the mental health of things, right? Because it's really something that's bugs me a lot because I'm not used to staying at home all the time <laughs> i'm i'm an introvert man so i am i mean i work from home i live from home so i mean it really didn't affect my day-to-day -day life right. what it did affect was you know i can't go to the gym and, and you know i train mma uh with a, some real fucking killers man right. and the only people allowed in the gym right now are active pros who have an upcoming fight so nobody else unless you're a professional and I'm 40 years old, man. That's a young man's game. I'm not trying to go into the UFC at 40. You know what I mean? Right. I just, I just, I, I really like to fight and it's a lot of fun. And that's my daily workout and my routine. I like to wake up in the morning, do some jujitsu, you know, do some Muay Thai or some boxing at night or something. And that's how I stay fit and I stay in shape. Um, I, I swear, man, I put on like 15 pounds since this coronation started. And, uh, and this, shit, this shit's killing me. I'm dying to punch somebody in the face, dude. <laughs> so how long how long you been practicing this uh, MMA stuff? I started in the nineties, long time long time ago. Um, mm -hmm. I just I always just did it for fun though. I never took it seriously. For me, it's just it's an aggression, it, and it, it keeps you humble, man. It, it keeps your pride in check. It keeps your ego in check. You know, um, it, it, like I say, it, it, you know, it raises the the humility, if you will. Right. You know, when there's you get in that cage, man, and that door shuts. There is, there's no, that's, that's true equality right there. You know, one-on-one, -on -one, I mean, there's, you know, the, the bullshit stops when the clock starts, you know? Right. And, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, sometimes, you know, and, and that's when you gotta, you know, humble yourself. And uh, that's the only way you get better, man, is by losing, by making mistakes and make sure that you don't make that same mistake again. Yeah, I, I, I saw this video, you and Phil Anselmo, uh, you're doing like a boxing match. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was backstage in Mexico. I, 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 I've hung out with Phil many, many, many times, man. I call him Uncle Phil. I, I love that dude. And, you know, Phil could have been a pro boxer. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, Emmanuel Stewart, uh, who is a very well-known boxer, would call Phil the night before every fight and ask Phil to dissect because he has such an in-depth knowledge of the sport. 
So me and Phil had always joked about it for years. Like, one of these days, dude, I'm going to put the fucking gloves on with you. And we happened to be playing a show in Mexico uh, together. And the day before, uh, when he got to the hotel, I was waiting in the lobby with boxing shorts on and gloves on. And when Phil got to the hotel, I had fucking, I forget who it was, somebody in the band had the Rocky theme song playing behind me. And I just yeah. went up and I, I started putting hands on him right in the middle of the lobby. And then uh, the next day when we were playing the festival, both of our dressing rooms were together. So he's like, dude, it ain't fair. I don't got no gloves. So the next day I took it, I'm like, motherfucker, I brought two pair. You think I came with one? I'm like, oh, hell no. So it was just for fun, man. We were both getting ready to go on stage. Um, so it was just a little fucking around. You know, I had my nose ring in still. And, you know, um, the, uh, you can see it on my face in the video. Like, I'm trying not to smile. But, like, the 11-year-old me is, like, coming out and going, dude, this is happening. This is happening. We're fighting Phil. Like, uh, it, was, it was cool, man. It was, a, it was fun. Definitely bucket list. All right. So Brian, uh, just just uh, I'm actually a Sri Lankan. I came from Sri Lanka. I live in the Philippines now. Uh, I heard about Brian Werner like few years back, and I first thought you were Marilyn Manson because Brian Warner and Brian Warner, he <laughs> you have like, and then they were saying like high priest of uh, Satan is, and then I thought because I think uh, Marilyn Manson was also given some sort of a title from Church of Satan, right? He was a reverend, but he was given that title directly from LaVey. Right. Um, and actually, it's funny because where Marilyn Manson is from, he's from Fort Lauderdale, where I live. Right. Uh, matter of fact, he went to high school about three blocks away from where I live. Um, so yeah, I get a lot of shit. It doesn't matter who I meet here. Oh, hi, I'm Brian. I get you know the man, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's funny is I was actually born uh, uh, with a different last name, but I was adopted when I was two years old. Uh, well, right. my it's my real, my real mom, but she got she married my stepdad, and his last name was Warner. And when right. my mom married him, I took his last name with her. Um, so it's actually not even my birth name. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I enjoyed everything up to Antichrist Superstar. I mean, I remember seeing Manson in night live in 95 and 96 and 97 back when it was cool. Mm. Uh, but then it got way too fucking just stupid and like David Bowie and shit. And I'm like, this just sucks. Go play some fucking metal again. You were cool when you were metal. Right. Yeah. So what is with what is with Florida? Because I think there seems to be a lot of metal people, metal icons coming from uh, Florida, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, they call it the sunshine sh the sunshine state, but I mean, man, there's nothing more dark and evil and magical than walking out into that fucking swamp right. and knowing, you know, like people up north and like, oh, Norway and the mountains and the forest is dark. And I'm like, yeah, but you can go walking in the forest whenever you want, probably be fine. You can't just go strolling through the Everglades without coming across a hundred things that's going to fucking kill you. <laughs> you know, so when you look out at that swamp at night, you're like alligators, crocodiles, boa constrictors, anacondas, rattlesnakes, you know, there's, there's pumas, bears, panthers. I mean, we have our own Bigfoot down here. There's just something dark and evil about, about a swamp at night or, or the early morning when the miasma is on the ground. You know, there's a certain kind of, uh, never forget that for every light that casts, there is a shadow. You know, so us being the sunshine state, there's a lot of shadows. <clears throat> so, so, Brian, can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and then uh, how did you discover the, like metal? Mm -hmm. I, I had it rough growing up, man, actually. You know, um, I'm not going to get too much into all that, but I mean, I, I was kind of a human punching bag for a while as a kid, you know, growing up. Um, and then I discovered metal. God, very early on, I, I think, and uh, no bullshit, I think one of the first songs I can even remember in life was, uh, I was like six years old and I had this little Walkman and it just picked up radio stations in like the 80s. Right. And I would hear the song when I was like five, six years old and I was jamming it. And it wasn't until I heard that song later when I was like 18, 19, and I heard that song again and, and my buddy was playing, I'm like, dude, I know that song. Uh, like, and I started reading, I'm like, dude, I what and then I it clicked what it was and it was King Diamond's Halloween, right? You know, 
but I remember being a kid and thinking it was Halloween, you are my bride, not my pride, you know? And I remember singing that like all oh, the Halloween song when I was a kid. Um, and then when I discovered, obviously at like 18, 19, who King Diamond, I was, I was just in love. I mean, I got King Diamond yeah. tattooed on my arm right there. I mean, I fucking love King Diamond. And then when I was like about seven, eight years old, Painkiller had come out and I remember seeing the commercials on TV and I was like, wow, that's fucking cool. And then about nine and 10, I went through my little kiss phase, you know, because of my cousin. And uh, I was in third grade, man. I didn't fucking know any better, you know. Um, by the time I got to, hey, stop. Sorry, dog. <laughs> um, by the time I got to fourth grade, I was the little kid. My best friend was the fat kid. And we were both kind of outcasts. But his brother played in a death metal band called Horace Specs. And uh, Brian, his kid's name was Brian Becca. He, he actually passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, I remember going sent to the guidance counselor's office because I wore his brother's band shirt and had a rotting priest on it and said, recycle, eat the dead. And I was like 10 years old and I got sent to the guidance counselor for it. And that just made, and they were like, you can't do this. And of course that just made me want it more and more. And we would always steal his brother's tapes, you know, like Sepultra. We didn't know it was Sepultura because there was no internet back then. You know, I mean, right. we were just, we had like the blank tape that had the writing on it. We're like, Sepultra, what is this, you know? And then uh, from there, it just progressed. By the time I was in like seventh, eighth grade, Slayer had just come out with Divine Intervention, which is just a quintessential album to me. Mm. You know, I was that 13 year old kid that was carving Slayer in his arms because he did it on the CD and shit. And then by, high, and it just kind of naturally progressed. I, mean, I, I gotta go back, you know, I mean, 1991, summer of 91 after fifth grade, I'll never forget. I spent the night at Brian's house and Brian, uh, his brother was babysitting us and he's like, I can't believe I got stuck. You know, babysitting you two faggots tonight. You know, fucking get your shit. You're coming with me. And uh, he took us to a concert because he got he had concert tickets and he wasn't gonna miss the concert. And it was uh, Pantera opening for Megadeth in '91 on the Vulgar Display of Power and Countdown Tour. And that was actually the first concert I ever went to. Wow. Uh, and uh, it wasn't until years later when I realized what it was that I had seen at, at such a young age. You know. And then as we just got older, it just progressed, you know, from Slayer to DSI, you know, from, I was a big Fear Factory fan back in the day. Hey, hey, shut, no, TV interview, please. Um, I was a big Fear Factory interview uh, fan back in the day when like Souls of a New Machine and uh, uh, D Manufacture had come out. Right. Yeah, you know, and nobody, like when I first heard those kick drums, uh, and nobody had ever played drums like that before. You know what I mean? Like we had heard the Metallica one and some other shit, but nothing like that kind of a, of a gallop pattern, you know? Um, syncopated, syncopated with the guitars, thank you. Um, so, but then they got fucking obsolete came out and it ruined them for me. Yeah. Like, like, so many, like so many bands of that era, like, you know, Sepultura, everybody hailed Roots. I couldn't stand it. Machine Head thought they were going to sound like Limp Bizkit too, and, and ruined that. Right. You know, and there was so many of them that just jumped on that fucking corn bandwagon. And then meanwhile, you had like Testament release The Gathering, you, you know, which is just like, you know, fuck this shit. And then at that point, that's when I just went full on skinless, dying fetus. I, I just went real underground around like 96, 97, 98, especially all my friends in high school were listening to Coal Chamber and I was listening to fucking Lividity and Flesh Grind, you know, like, right. so, and then the 2000s came around and like everybody had just now discovered In Flames 10 years later. <laughs> and I'm like, oh dude, listen to my band. It's like, dude, I heard At The Gates like 10 years ago. Like this, this doesn't impress me. Right. And then fast forward to like 2010s and now you got all these like little kids that come out with these slam bands. Like, dude, we're so brutal. It's like, dude, you're a devourment ripoff. Right. Like, and you can pretty much describe 90% of these bands with insert sentence long band name here, play by men in flock of seagulls haircuts, African earplugs, Crayola tattoos and skinny jeans. And, and it's all the same goddamn jet rip. And I mean, it was, it was cool. I mean, there's a few bands that do that and do it well. 
Um, Meshuggah's one. And I'm not, you know, I just don't like the followers, man. I like the innovators. Right. You know, I, I like the people that create, not the people that copy. You know, there, there's bands in that genre and that gen genre that are very good. I'm not trying to take away from the genre as a whole. I'm talking about all the people that just jump on the bandwagon later on, you know. Uh, you know, Beneath the Massacre, Despised Icon, Aborted, Meshuggah. I'm not taking anything away from those bands. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, hell, I, I like, you know, the Red Chord. You know, a lot of those bands are, are very good. Um, I just don't, it, but when the scene becomes so oversaturated with so many of them, it just, it lacks identity to me. If yeah. that makes sense. <clears throat> So Brian, when did you when did you first like uh, figure out that you can sing? Um, I was just when I realized I couldn't play drums <laughs> or really play guitar. <laughs> um, no, I mean I can play guitar. I played guitar for twenty years. You know, I, I I'm not a guitarist, right. but on my scales, I know my chords and my voicings and my pentatonics and my minors and my majors. You know, I'm, I, I can write a lot of the music. I wrote a lot of the music for Infernia, and I'm writing a lot, some of it for 93 as well. Um, I, uh, I, I just don't have the attention span mm. to sit there and focus on playing, especially in a live setting. If we're at practice or something that I can sit there and I'm, I'm focused on what I'm playing, sure. But when I go on that stage, I'm looking at the crowd. I'm looking around me. I'm, I'm in performance mode at that. I can't focus on what... I'm playing tight, you know? Um, that's why I just, I just much rather enjoy singing and using the audience as my instrument rather than being focused on precision playing. You know what I mean? I'll leave that for the guitar nerds. Yeah, because you, when you go on stage, I, I see a lot of, uh, lot of videos. You, you, when you go on see a stage, when you see the, the, the mosh pit, when you see the crowd, you're kind of like, like, you're like Genghis Khan, right? Like you're <laughs> commanding your followers, like. <laughs> well, no, it's usually when I see them not doing anything. That's when I'll go in and start pushing people. Right. Hey, when, I, when I see them, everybody's, because, dude, listen, man, whoever went to a show and stood there with their arms crossed all night and just watching and then went home and go, wow, I had a really fun time last night just standing there doing nothing. Right. Said nobody ever, you know? It was, dude, that was a killer show. The pit was insane, dude. The singers jumping off stage. Like, you know, they were inviting other people to come jump off stage. My girlfriend got to do it. was a really fun time. I'll definitely go see them when they come back. We had a lot of fun. You know, you have to, you have to just do more, like we were just talking about, you have to do more than the oversaturated market. Yeah. You know, every other band is doing the same exact thing. Like, look at Behemoth, what they just did with that live stream. Like, you see all these other bands live streaming their practice and shit. They shot a goddamn movie. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I'm like, wow, there's a band that takes a fucking uh, performance seriously. You know, you know what you're going to get when you go see fucking Watane. You know what you're going to see when you go see Guar. You yeah. know, and, and if fuck even Cannibal. The Cannibal's a band that, you know, they don't have to do much. Why? They're all fucking headbanging the entire time. You know, they're syncopated. They know what they're doing and they're fucking precise. You know, um, I, with us, when I, when I was in Vital, you know, I, for me, man, I grew up as a fan of that band. Right. Uh, I remember being 21 years old, singing Dechristianize in my room, pretending I would want to be on stage singing that song. So everyone's like, well, I really like your music. I'm like, well, I didn't write that, first of all, so it's not mine. And that's everybody here, man, that's in this venue tonight. That's all of our song, yeah. you know? And I'll see kids mouthing the words. I'll be the first to go give them the mic and let them sing a line or something, you know? Again, they get to go, oh, man, I got to sing Dechristianize last night. That was cool. I mean, fuck yeah, because you know what? I used to be that kid. You know, that was like, dude, let me fucking, let me, let me sing a line real quick. You know, I used to be that, that over, that over eager, that inspired, you know, kid that wanted to just be a part of the show. And you know what? Fuck it. Let them. Mm. <clears throat> so Brian, what, what is your like first band you started performing with? First band I was ever in was a band called Autism. Uh, back in the 90s. Uh, they had been around, they were an old school, and they were 
I was 19 and all those dudes were in their thirties already. You know, they had played with death and Testament and stuff. And uh, from there I had another band called uh, Demonocracy. When I was like 17, 18, we played Milwaukee Metal Fest. And then I had a stupid ass band called, uh, well, no, I'm sorry. I joined a band called Karanzan like early 2002. Uh, I was good friends with Richard Christie from Death. Yeah. And uh, Richard, Richard got me in with that band. And then from there, I was uh, in Fernigan. Um, you know, uh, we did a lot of the Infernion stuff in 04 and 05. And then I got the call on the Monstrosity in 06 which was just a trial by fire, man. Like I had, I had toured once, mm. but not as a fucking headliner on stage, 16 song set list, Europe, you know, European tour, fucking under the spotlight, you know, and it was just kind of thrown to the wolves and it was a sink or swim moment. And that's when I realized that, you know, it's a lot hard, a lot hard, a lot of hard work, a lot harder work, excuse me. Um, than when I had initially anticipated. <clears throat> and uh, I ended up getting fired from Monstrosity. I got fired, you know, Lee fired me because I had timing issues and, and some other things and I needed to go back and kind of redevelop myself. And the same day I got fired was the same day Infernion signed our record contract with Prosthetic. Right. And, and, uh, and then I kind of came back and did two albums with Infernion on a major label and we toured with Guar and we toured with The Casualties and actually we toured with Vital Remains back in the day too. Yeah. Uh, and then I got to, and then I got the call for Vital. Um, and then, you know, even though me and him are beefing a little bit right now, but you know, I, I me and Tony, you know, Tony taught me a lot, man. And, and I'll, I'll always thank him for that. You know, I remember when I got the job of Vital, I kind of had some similar timing issues, which it's hard as a singer, um, especially when you're changing drummers as often as we do, you know, where it's, it's never the same. Yeah. And I remember yeah. sitting in the car with Taylor and he would just, And they would make me sing in, in, in the car to him clapping his hands and then the next one would be. And he would make me sing it at different tempos in, in the car driving for like 300 miles for like two, three hours before the next show. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's really where I, I, I really developed my, my tone and my sound and now my, my timing and my precision thanks to Tony and it's the vital, so. Yeah, Brian, but uh, one of the my favorite videos of you is uh, Graven Images. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. That's really awesome. So can you tell me about that band uh, and then that uh, that record? <laughs> uh, yeah, that was actually my audition video for Vital. When I heard they were looking for a singer, I was like, here you go, dude. And I sent them that. And then Tony was like, okay, dude, you got it. Like, this is perfect. This is what we're looking for. Um, yeah, you know, we... I got stabbed in the back, you know, by people that were members number 12 and 13 that had, you know, I had had 11, 12 guitar players before them, a couple other bass players and drummers. And uh, it is what it is, you know. Um, they thought that they could fire me from a band that I basically, it was only my name on the record contract. Right. You know, you, you, you two weren't on the first album and you weren't on the second album. I'm the only original member. Um, the keyboard player, like, dude, you joined the band in 2008. We recorded the first album in 04. Like, how do you have rights to anything? Like, you know, so I quit. And then I said, fine, you want to have it that way? Fine, I'm done, bye. Here's your drop notice from the record label, the booking agent, the sponsors, and everybody in, fuck off, I'm joining Vital. Mm. So um that was a fun video we shot that at full sale in orlando and that was all kind of my conception of what i wanted to do and it, it was a lot of fun to, to work with a budget for something because i do a lot of video editing myself a lot of the vital tour videos i've done and the graphic design so it was cool to like get a chance to go work hands-on in a real studio and, and be able to explore the space of uh of what my imagination was trying to conceive Luke Leonard and Pia Hogue, you know, they, they did a great job of organizing everything and really putting everything together and kind of brought to life what I had been envisioning and kind of showed, you know, it really did a lot of hard work on that, man. You know, much respect to them. Yeah, because <clears throat> I remember watching it first time and then you have uh, that last supper scene and then suddenly everybody becomes like, you know. 
<laughs> I had seen that last, I had seen a meme once upon a time of like a zombie last supper. And I, I was like, dude, I want to recreate this. You know what I mean? Right. And then we had watched, uh, I had been watching, watched a movie, uh, The Last Temptation of Christ, you know, where the devil goes to tempt Christ on the cross for one last time. So I was kind of trying to do a take off of that a little bit. You know, where the devil comes in and shows him, like, you know, look at what these people have done to you. Look at how they treat you. You know, you want to sacrifice yourself to save these people that fucking hate you, you know, which is a very defeatist and uh, ideology to me. Mm. <clears throat> so you also did a very, I mean, I think, I think that's probably the best cover I heard of uh, Creeping Death. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That was yeah. done as the, uh, the whole album was the story of the Bible from beginning to end. Uh, the first, you know, from the fall of Lucifer to Adam and Lilith to Cain and Abel. Uh, instead of Noah and the Flood, we did it Zia Sudra, the original Sumerian story. Mm -hmm. And then we realized we didn't have a song about Moses anywhere on the album yet. We're like, dude, let's cover Creeping Death. You know, it, it, fits, the, it fits the concept of the album. We already tuned in E Standard. Um, and then, you know, we've been looking for a way to get Dave Brocky involved at some point, you know, because Dave's my boy, man. I miss that dude. I fucking love that dude. We were originally going to do a song, an original song with him. And I told him, I was like, dude, I got a perfect name for the song. He's like, what's that? I'm like, we're going to call it Gornography. And then we ended up not doing it. And then he stole that name from me and he put it on Lust in Space, that motherfucker. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I had seen him about a couple months later. He didn't tell me he was going to do it. And then I seen it and I'm like, let's see what you did. Um, it, it was cool though, man. I was on, he gave me a shout out on the album for it. It was cool. Yeah. You, you had a uh, Gua on that album and you tour with them, right? Gua? Yeah, in 2010, we did 98 shows with Gua from September to January, which most tours are 30 days. And this was just a full season, man. It was so long. It was a, that was a long, hard tour. So fun though. Very, very fun. You know, playing sold out shows in front of a thousand people every night, the house of blues, I mean, certainly doesn't suck, but we blew up four vehicles. We've been fighting with each other a lot. Um, there was two guys in the band that were kind of fighting with everybody. And I had my boy, Adam Sagan playing drums on that tour. And Adam was one of my best friends since we were 14 and Adam passed. We play, he also played in circle to circle and a couple other power metal bands. He was in Into Eternity for a while and Adam passed away back in uh, 2016. So as hard and as rough as the time that I, that was, I'll always cherish it, man. That was good times I had with my brother that I'll never forget. Right. <clears throat> so uh, Vital Remains, as you said, the <clears throat> band has been there for a long time and then now you're, you were part of, uh, you know, for a few years. Uh, you remember touring with them? I, I, I know that you guys did a Asian, Southeast Asian tour. Uh, so can you tell me a little bit about the tour and your experience? It was interesting, uh, to say the least. I, I mean, uh, and, and nothing against the fans of Indonesia. This isn't a criticism. So I don't want it to be taken that way. It was just a unique experience. I've never seen an entire festival completely shut down for evening prayer. Yeah. I've never seen 30,000 people get so quiet so fast. It was weird. I, you know, it was like all of a sudden the music's playing, we're backstage, and then you could hear a pin drop. And I'm like, dude, what's, what's going on? And like, we, I've never experienced that before, you know? And they're like, well, no, this is an Islamic country. And, you know, they have prayer time, you know, right now all the stages have to go dark for this time. And I'm like, Normally in a crowd of 30,000 people, like there's gonna be some noise. And it was just weird to see like so many people and it was just dead silent. I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to think. <laughs> I, um, it was cool though. The, the hardest thing for me was, was number one, getting over that jet lag. That jet lag fucked me up pretty good for a while. Mm -hmm. um, really, really fucked me up for a good couple of days before I got my senses back. I was just kind of, hiding out in the hotel and, and I was awake, I was asleep. So I really didn't get to experience much at Hammersonic. Um, then, and then a lot of times, man, it's fly, play, fly, play. You don't really get too much time. We did get a day off in Singapore when Singapore was beautiful, beautiful city, man. Um, 
And then I, I was flying my drone and I fucking hit a crane on top of a skyscraper with my th brand new thousand dollar drone and lost my drone. I was, I was pissed. Um, but the dome, the biodomes were absolutely beautiful. Um, and Singapore was, I, I, I had no idea that Singapore had, was, had that much money. Um, I didn't know what to expect. I just knew nothing of the culture there. Uh, Bangkok, I had a great time hanging out in Bangkok. You know, a friend of ours from LA lives out there. <clears throat> and we had a, a really, really fun time in Bangkok that night. Um, and, and the next day too. I was a pretty disappointed though, man. I was really looking forward to finding like an authentic Thai boxing gym while I was there because I do Muay Thai, you know. Yeah, so I, I brought all my gear and everything <laughs> else. I was like, yeah, I want to go. I want to go do some spar, maybe you know, jump, fall in on a class or two while I'm there. And I couldn't find one anywhere. And all the ones that were available, they only had class at night when we had to be on stage at the same time. So it was one of those things where it's like, man, I'm so close. I, I, I but I can't make it happen. You know, and then uh, the last show we had to go back to Indonesia and then drive really far uh, to Bang Dung. And the show was killer. They had great pyro on stage for us. The crowd was awesome. Uh, but we had a bad situation at the end of the night where they tried, some security guards tried to take our bass player's passport and only his passport. It was really weird, you know, and then the, tour manager kind of went to the office and grabbed him and was like we got to go now so it was kind of we didn't know what was happening we were kind of rushed out of there really 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 fast mm. um I, I was really disappointed i was looking forward to like maybe doing philippines and manila um i know kuan lapor won't let me personally in i was told the government looked into me and they're like no i'm not allowed in which really surprised me that they allowed me in singapore um, I, apparently the promoter said that he had to go have a meeting with the Singapore government about me specifically coming in. Um, but he smoothed it out. He, he got it. Okay. I really wanted to play Tokyo, you know, maybe done a show or two in China cause we were right there and maybe some Australia too. Um, it was unfortunate. We only got to do the four shows. I would really would have liked to have done more. I know that scene in Sri Lanka from what I hear is killer. Yes. <laughs> so. <clears throat> yeah so so brian the vital remain fans uh we heard about you know slayer fans we heard about all this a lot but can you tell me a little bit about the vital vital remain fans uh, that come to the shows <laughs> um I, again i only have the limited experience in asia so i can't speak about the, you know much about the vital fans in asia i mean from what i saw they were nuts you know we were the, the shows in indonesia were packed they were killer they were very appreciative, you know, of, of people coming there, man, you know. Uh, and, and I always love that. For me, it's the vital fans in Latin America. Yeah. That, the, the Latin American fans, I call them satanic Hispanics. <laughs> you know, fucking, they, they, they come for war, bro. You know, they, they come to fucking rage and kill. Like, we played a show in uh, Costa Rica one time with Lamb of God. And it was just two bands on the show. Just us and each band got to play for like an hour. And it was like 3,000 people at the show. And the promoter's like, dude, when you guys got off stage, there was a good five, 600 people that walked out. Right. I was like, why? And like, were they pit? Did we suck or something? They're like, no, they loved it. I'm like, then why'd they leave? And they're like, we saw what we came here for. I'm like, we're not here for anything else. We came here to see fucking Vital. And, uh, and I always have a great time in South America, man. I love those crowds down there. I love I loved playing in Brazil and Chile and... Colombia, especially, man, going to with puta. Um, European fans, European fans are as diehard as they come. You know, you, you always hear them screaming, fucking let us pray, war in paradise in the crowd, especially Poland and the, the Eastern Bloc countries. Like, they've been fans since fucking day one. Right. You know, so they're always good and welcoming. But the thing with European fans is, yeah, they've been fans since day one. They're they're old now, man. They're not getting into a mosh pit at fucking forty eight years old anymore. Right. They'll come. To every, they'll come to every show. They'll they'll buy the shirt. They'll always love and support the band. But you're not getting. I mean, you'll get a couple fifty year old dudes like you know they'll go in there and start pushing some kids around or something, but not like they do in South America, dude. You know, South. I've I've seen just some insane, insane fucking mosh pits and wall that that's and. Colombia and, and Chile and uh, you know they fucking they take their metal very seriously down there. 
and I just fucking much, much respect. Yeah, I heard that you actually broke some, like you had an accident in Chile. You yeah, broke your ribs. Yeah, it's uh, we were playing in Santiago, and on the third song, we were playing uh, Black Magic Curse off of uh, Dawn of the Apocalypse, and I jumped off stage, and it was just a little jump, maybe five feet, nothing like what I jumped off balconies and shit before, man. You know, this is just a little bunny hop, mm -hmm. and I happened to fall, but when I fall, I hit <clears> the like corner of a bench. And I broke two ribs and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't do shit. And I had a friend of mine from Iowa who used to fight in the UFC back in the 90s. And he was actually there at the show that night, standing on the side of the stage. Mm. And I came running over. I'm like, fuck, man, I can't breathe. He's like, you broke your ribs. He goes, suck it up. You got a couple more songs. I'm like, a couple more songs. I'm not going back out there. He's like, no. He goes, do you remember this fight I did? He goes, I broke my ribs in the first round. I stuck it out four more rounds. If I can take that, you can take this. He's like, your fans are out there right now. This is where you want to you want to bitch out and be known for that, or you want to be known as the dude who broke his ribs and stepped up and finished the show. And I was like, all right, let, let's do it. And he's like, just take it slow. And I did did another eight songs that night. And uh, he's like, I got my own car here. He goes, I will personally drive you to the hospital when we leave. And it did. And then sure enough, x-rays. Yeah, I had two broken ribs. And then I flew home, got like four days of rest. And then we started the U.S. tour like three days later. Wow. So, <clears throat> so, so Brian, uh, coming from like place like Sri Lanka where, you know, when I first got the ability to buy something from Amazon, uh, that I that was like after my like second job. That's the time I could actually afford it. So I could have a credit card and you know. The first thing I bought from the internet is the Satanic Bible. Nice. <laughs> nice. Because we heard about the book. Uh, yes, uh, we talked. Uh, I used to have a couple of friends. We were very much interested about it. Uh, I think the first time I kind of really got interested is when I watched the movie Rosemary's Baby. Mm -hmm. That's like where the really the idea came up, and then I got the Satanic Bible, uh, and I was really uh, attracted to it. More of uh, you know, uh, sort of a personal development sort of end. I'm looking at you know improving myself, be strong, you know. Um, exactly. Not, self empowerment. Yes, yeah, self empowerment, and then not giving up, not give shit about the psychic vampires because I have experienced it a lot. People who sucking up to you. I just want to suck off your energy, man. You know, you got to get rid of those people. Take that good guy lapel. Off. You know, there's so many statements, and that's what the basis of what the Satanic Reformation, the book that I was writing, was going to hint on was just re a reproclamation uh, of these same tenants and a new liberal society that looks down on most of these things. Right. Where, no, our quest for individualism, personal sovereignty, rejecting this arbitrary authority. You know, I, for us metalheads, we fought this fight against white Christians in power. You know, senators, presidents, Congress, you know, the PMRC here in, in the United States in the 80s and 90s that wanted to ban our music. And right. we went to court. And I mean, we, we fought for it for years. So we're not going to bow down to the U.S. government. I'm sure as fuck not about to bow down to a bunch of blue-haired lesbians. You know, no. If you can't take it, you know, I'm a Satanist. Your opinion of me is fucking irrelevant. Right. I, I, I don't care. Mag magic isn't something you do. Magic is something that you are. It's a way to manipulate your environment in accordance with your will and my will and my will alone. Yeah. You know, my, my body is inviolable and subjected to my own will alone. Um, so therefore, I'll make all the decisions regarding my personal health and, and my personal being to the best scientific knowledge available in the world, regardless of the religious or political beliefs of others. You know what I mean? <clears throat> I, I'm best suited to make the decisions for my life, mm. not the government, not society, not my neighbor, not the police, not my teachers. I will decide what is best for me. Yes. So, uh, so Brian, when did you first get interested of Satanism? Very early, very, very early. I mean, like first grade, six, seven years old early, I knew that I didn't believe. 
Mm. I, I, I went to, uh, they sent me to the religion classes and, and it never, ever took with me. You know, pretty much I, I make the joke and it, it is, it is a funny joke, but it is kind of serious too, that I stopped believing in Jesus when I realized Santa Claus wasn't real. Right. Because the same people that had lied to me about Santa, they lied to me about the Easter bunny. They lied to me about the tooth fairy. They lied to me about St. Nick, but I'm supposed to believe these same people when they tell me about Jesus. It's like, you know, you shattered all of the magic in the world by telling me this bullshit as a kid. And now you want me to believe you. <clears throat> so it never took with me. And I remember like, I'd be in the religion classes back in the days when you had the headphones that came over the ears, you know, and you could break the little piece off the end mm. and stretch the wire in real long like this. And I would ring the cord up through my sleeve and I wear like, and I would just sit there like this with the headphone in <laughs> like this. I would sit in class and I'd have like South of Heaven or Rain and Blood playing. And I'd just be like, like, you know, it was one of those religion classes where it wasn't taught in school. It was like a Wednesday night. You know, so it's like, this ain't on my fucking report card. I don't really have to do this. Like, I'm only here because I'm being forced to. Right. And the only time I'd ever participate is when they talked about the occult and they would talk about, you know, the darker side. I'm like, nah, you got my attention now. Like, this is interesting. <laughs> like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Like, what's this about? Um, and then really it was kind of Marilyn Manson and Deicide that opened that door for me. Like, uh, mm -hmm. Marilyn Manson on the very first album, um, so the portrait of an American family was really kind of one that came out like 94 and I had heard like once upon the cross around the same time. Mm. And then I bought, like you, I, I bought the satanic Bible and it resonated with me. It just made a lot more sense to me. And then, uh, I kind of got scared from it actually. And, and I was like, no, this is the devil. You know, the, the religious aspect of me kind of kicked in. And then I went back to try to, denounce it and go back to being Catholic. <clears throat> and then I got real hard into drugs and shit like that when I was 16, 17. And then I decided to quit. And I went back and I reread it. And I, I understood at that point that, you know, this was my decision to quit. This is my decision to make a better life for myself. It's not praying. It's not God. It's my inner strength that's right. getting me to these calls. It's my conviction that's not going to let me lose this fight. <clears throat> um, the opposite of the 12 steps, you know, give, give yourself up to a higher power. No, fuck that. That's your first mistake. Mm. You know, you need to stop giving up on yourself and start believing in yourself more, not fucking going, oh, I have no control. No, you are in full fucking control of your life. You know, um, it's hard and it's a struggle, but you know, that's the way it is for all of us. And you can't forge steel until you melt it first. You have to break yourself down. And at that time is when I started reading a lot more Aleister Crawley, Diary of a Drug Fiend, um, um, Magic in Theory and Practice, and started getting more into the Kabbalistic end of things from the Golden Dawn and, and Weight. And uh, um, who was the other guy that wrote Modern Magic? Um, Donald Michael Craig and a few others but then I got away from that and just started focusing more on the Crawley and the book of the law which these days I mean obviously I'll always be a Satanist but spiritually speaking I've been more thelemic in my outlook of spirituality mm. um, and like anything man you know are we the same person we were 20 years ago no as you grow you evolve you change your way of thinking, new thing, new evidence comes to light. You know, there's new things to consider and reevaluate your positions on things. And that's how you grow as an individual. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but Brian, you, are, you were part of uh, the Satanic Temple, right? When it was started? Yeah, me and, uh, me and Lucian, back before Lucian was even the, um, uh, the, the spokesperson. Um, bear with me one second here, man. I was supposed to pick somebody up. Um, leading, uh, I got about five more minutes. Um, yeah. I, I, I actually, I have a business meeting. I have to get to meet with somebody tonight. So I got a few more minutes. Um, yeah, me and, uh, they had done a, a protest here in Florida before Lucian Greaves, his real name's Doug, was the spokesperson for the temple. And I had seen um, some of the things that they did and I wanted to get involved. And we did very, very early, me, Doug and Kevin and a guy named David Guinan. 
Right. Um, and Doug made me the honorary high priest for being the first member. And then we did like the, the protest for the Westboro. We did the, if you go back and you see the Protect the Children Project, that's actually launched on May 15th, which is my birthday. You know, and then I appeared on national TV several times with Doug as the high priest. Mm. And a lot of things changed. They turned into a very liberal leftist social justice kind of causes that I, that to me don't align with Satanism. So I left the organization and then, then they all started kind of firing back. Oh, there is no high priest, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, you know, here's me and him on national TV together saying this. And uh, it was just, I just, I, I can't stand that organization and what it's become. It's one of these things where, you know, I, that's not what it was meant to represent in the very beginning. It was meant to represent everybody who follows the left-hand path. Temple of Set, Church of Satan, yeah. or OTO, you know, anybody that could kind of buy, come and stand together for a minute and go, you know what, fuck the and, and bullshit, but all of us are facing scrutiny in, a le in the legal theater right now. And if we don't want our rights taken away, we need to fight for them. <clears throat> and that's, that's what it was initially meant to represent. And I had actually, at once upon a time, I said, you know, let's form a council of nine and have everybody who represents different sectors be have a spot at the table to be able to represent luciferianism you know things like the mlo and, and watane and you know somebody from the oto and or and the church of satan and the temple of set mm. and you know and this way we can all have a democratic voice of you know and have kind of a coalition if you will and um yeah, and then it, it didn't turn into that. It turned into a hierarchy of I, I, I'm the king, I wear the crown, and I'm uh, oh, sorry. It's, it's, and it's really funny if you kind of, if you think about it, you're trying to organize people who abscond themselves from organizations. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I got actually when uh, the temple of, uh, satanic temple, I actually, you know, became a member online and I even got the, that my membership certificate because I was quite interested of, uh, you know, coming back to that. And then we were sort of thinking of putting up a local chapter here. But what happened is the same, I have the same uh, sort of idea what you have because I didn't like the things that they were standing up for later on because it was all because of all these liberal, uh, like they said, like, you know, they go and uh, they're going to like, walk with all the Muslims and you know they were like they were, they were kind of stupid right? I wasn't going to say it I was going to leave that topic alone <laughs> I swear to God I wasn't going to mention anything bad about Islam in this interview um, <laughs> you know I, I was really trying to avoid but yeah that was a big nail in the coffin too I'm like wow a bunch of fucking you know pink haired goth kids are going to go walk some Muslim I'm like you realize these people don't like you right Right. <laughs> like, like if you were if you were on fire on the street, they wouldn't stop to piss on you, you know. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, that amongst many, 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 many other things, you yeah. know, uh, this gender equality bullshit, and I, I, I'm over the feminism. I, I'm over a lot of it. You know, I really am. That's a political discussion we can definitely have in another interview if you'd like. Yeah. You know, um, who you decide to suck, fuck, fondle, and cornhole, I could care less. Right. Just stay the fuck out of my house, the crackheads and the government. I just want, I fight for the right to be left alone. I'm not green. I'm not blue. I'm not red. I'm fucking purple. I, I'm right in the middle of all of them. Let's just, let, let, let gays get married and let them have their guns. Okay? All right. Um, uh, <laughs> so... It is what it is, man. We're, we're living in very interesting time. I'm all for having a heart. You have to be an asshole not to have a heart. I always make the argument, if you need religion to guide you morally, then you lack empathy, not religion. I don't need a book to tell me that killing and stealing is wrong. Right. You know, I have that here in my heart. I know these things are wrong. I know I'm a good person at heart. Um, and I'm all for having a heart, as long as it doesn't override your brain. Right. Like, like I was, I was, I got into a huge fight earlier on today on Facebook and I actually got banned because somebody put up an article that said how to eat out a non-op trans woman. 
trans women who haven't had the bottom surgery and the trans sex experts weigh in on oral pleasure. And I'm like, dude, you're gonna be sucking some dick. Okay. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. you know, let's, let's call it what it is. It's two dudes, so, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, dude, you're gay. That's fine. There's nobody saying there's anything wrong with that, but let's fucking put two brain cells together and talk about, you have a dude who, you have a man with a dick who wears women's clothes that, that wants oral pleasure. Well, you're not eating a vagina. So that means? Yeah. You're, <laughs> you're what? <laughs> you know, it, that just means you're gay and that's fine. Be that, be happy, be proud, be whatever, but don't, Tell me that I need to modify basic biology because it offends your subjective sense of who you are as a person. Right. No, I'm not going to forget about every lesson in biology I've ever learned to make your feelings not hurt. Sorry, not going to do it. Facts over feelings. Right. <laughs> so, so, Brian, um, can you tell me a little bit about what's your upcoming plans? I know you also have your band, uh, 93. Yeah, 93 man, me and uh, Matt DeVries, the guitar player from Chimera, and he played bass in Fear Factory and uh, he's playing and Six Feet Under. So he's playing bass for us and uh, Tim Young playing drums. <clears throat> and then I have two up and comers, man. These guys are just phenomenal guitar players. I, absolute fucking just awesome dudes to fucking work with. Chris and, uh, Chris Jawao and Rithra Kiev. Um, Brith is just an amazing songwriter. and Chris is just uh, one hell of a shredder. Um, and the music they're writing is just absolutely incredible. I'm really, really proud to be a part of it. And everything that I've done in my career up to this point has led me to this project, I believe. 93 is taken from Aleister Crowley's uh, Book of the Law, Do What Thou Wilt Shall Be the Whole of the Law. <clears throat> love is the law, love under will. Those two main words being love and will in ancient Greek are thelema and agape. And the Greeks used to put a numerical value to every letter in their alphabet. And if you add up the numerical value of Thelema is 93 and Agape is also 93. Right. So 93 is an invocation of love and will. <clears throat> um, so it has its occult roots. Anybody that's ever studied Crawley will automatically know what that name means. But it also doesn't put us into a box, man, where we have to be deicide, we have to be morbid angel. What if I want to be catatonia? Mm. If in five years from now, I feel like putting something out that sounds like septic flush, or you know, what if I go, you know, full black metal? If you, you know, we're not confined artistically to any, you know, parameters. I, I like to be able to have the freedom to explore, mm -hmm. um, and, and who knows where it's going to go. But we're going to be, uh, we should have everything done and recorded by the end of the year, obviously. COVID had a big impact on us being able to be in the same room together and put a, put a big, uh, we were all supposed to be together in April to record, um, but then April was quarantine, man. So, you know, we're trying to do the best we can do remotely at the moment. Right. So, so Brian, uh, any message to the viewers? Hail Satan. 666. Six, six. <laughs> Do it, do it thou wilt should be the whole, the law, love is the law, love under will. So, so Brian, I, I mean, uh, when I messaged you on Facebook, I, I, I didn't think that you would actually reply to me. Like, you know, I was, uh, I was wanted to talk to you. So I'm really glad that you did. And uh, you're so humble of you. Uh, and sometimes I, I do ignore a man, but your message was cool. You know, it was a very respectful message. And uh you know, you guys are from a part of the world I don't normally get a lot of interview requests from. Um, yeah. You know, it's usually somewhere in the States or Europe or somewhere. And, and I do as many as I can, you know, when I can. I mean, I do own a business and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm usually very busy. But, you know, Philippines, man, I'd never performed there before. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, like I said, when we were in Asia, the fans were some of the most grateful fans I've ever come across. They were so happy for us to be there and playing and you know, anytime I can get a chance to give back to the fans out there, man, I always love to do so. Right. You would really love Philippines, uh, Brian, because Philippines is, uh, you know, they were Christianized or Catholic by Spanish, right? Because Spanish were here for a long time. And by the people like Juan Peng Rodriguez and <laughs> right. But there's, a, there's so much uh, occult 
uh, you know, there's a so many witchcraft and, you know, those things here that is very native to the Philippines. There's so, there's so many, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't want to say superstition, but there's so many things that they believe about nature. And uh, so you would actually really love, love it here because there's, you know, so much of that. <laughs> we have a lot here in Miami too, with the because we have a very heavy uh, Haitian population here. So there's yeah. uh, a lot of voodoo stores and Santeria and stuff like that here as well. Right. <clears throat> so Brian, uh, have a great evening. Uh, thank you for joining. Thank, thank you, my friend. <laughs> Cheers.